Hi everyone, I'm Vaishnavi and I'm on the product team at Hasura. It's great to have you all tune in to this much awaited session on how we at Hasura, like everything else that we do, make data federation also a piece of cake. Now with that, let's get into the agenda for today. So what is all this buzz around data and federation and access about these days? The one quintessential undeniable fact is that data is the lifeline of modern day software and application development. And in today's world, we are faced by an overwhelmingly large amount of data, and it's not all that easy to make sense of this data and put it to good use. Let us take a look at why this is the case. With the data sprawl that's happening today, we see that data more often than not is present in a large number of data sources spread across databases, REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, and these could be exposed through internal or external services. And typically, each of these individual entities of data is handled by different teams and may even have different access rules. But at the end of the day, we want the data to be accessed by various consumers, and these consumers could be your user-facing applications, internal APIs, or even external APIs. You might want to utilize this data for different kinds of applications also. And broadly, this could be data transactions or the OLTP use cases for application development or data analytics, the OLAP use cases for taking business decisions. And the tried and tested way to expose data from producers to the consumers remains building data APIs. And those of us here who've built scalable production-ready APIs across massive amounts of data know that it takes a lot of time and it's not a lot of fun, right? Now, all of these takes months to years of effort to do it the conventional DIY way. To think building APIs is hard on its own, in a large organization, there are also allied challenges vis-a-vis -vis complex data models. Say I'm trying to modernize my tech and move to a microservice architecture, or I already have a microservice architecture. Now that by design is a decentralized model uh, for good reason. I have a large number of independent teams that handle a bunch of these data sources or APIs. So not everyone may have equal access or ownership to these data sources. But as an organization as a whole, I want a unified data layer to be able to take those data-driven business decisions. I might want a unified data model for my applications from a security performance and access standpoint. Now, there is another major, major piece as you're trying to productionize your APIs. I have all of these large amounts of data and APIs on top of that data. Now, different teams are working on this data, right? Now, how do I make sure that all the iterations happening on this data and the data models is not breaking my consumers or the downstream applications? How do I operationalize and scale this federated data model while still living and breathing the spirit of microservice architecture? With that, let's jump into how we solve this at Hasura. When we look at federation and data access, we tackle all the challenges that we spoke about just now. And this can be seen predominantly in three dimensions. The first being able to build performant APIs on your data easily. And next, federating and joining across those different kinds of data sources so you can query anything with minimal effort. And finally, being able to scale and iterate easily over your data models and also being able to collaborate and release confidently across a large number of streams. Now, coming to the first aspect uh, that, you know, building APIs is tedious. Now, conventionally, something that takes uh, months or years with DIY becomes a days or weeks timeline with Hasura. And Hasura is eliminating or automating a majority of these time-consuming parts of API development. And this lets your teams focus on building the competitive edge and shipping the differentiation. So Hasura gives you instant APIs over a bunch of your data sources. And along with this, we also do caching, monitoring, security control, all of which is required for productionizing your APIs. And this saves more than 50 to 70% of your effort, which otherwise would have gone into building all of this. Now, uh, let us focus on this piece of your data source architecture. Uh, we have some paths apparently merging all of these disparate data sources and seamlessly enabling data access to the consumers. Now, imagine achieving this manually with DIY frameworks. 
you'd have to write a ton of code to join each of these data sources, maybe even copy data from one source to another, or write complex querying logic to be able to get related data from independent data sources. And with every iteration, this becomes an even more tedious job. But with Hasura, those days are gone. We'll take a look at what we do, right? All of us here know that Hasura gives instant APIs on top of your data sources, be it databases, existing GraphQL APIs, or even existing REST APIs individually. But what we also do is if you have semantically related data in any of these data sources, we equally instantly give you an API over all of these data sources and even join all of these all of this all of the data in here together. Now this brings in a unified data access layer very easily for you to get productive immediately. So you'll be able to run nested queries and get data from multiple sources all at once. And along with this, we continue to have, you know, security monitoring, caching, and all of the other amazing capabilities on top. Uh, let's take a look at where this fits in, uh, in terms of an e-commerce application example, right? Say you have your account information in one database, your order information in another database. Uh, you have existing GraphQL endpoint to query the product information and you get the region information from a rest endpoint now in the microservice world you actually could have four different teams working with these four data sources and one team can't fully access everything from another another team's domain now in such a scenario if i wanted to run a query like this where for a given account id and order id i want to know all the names of products in that order now, this we see has at least three levels of nesting. And if you were to do this by hand, you'd have to build custom code for every query combination like this. Fetch the product information from the GraphQL endpoint, potentially do a lot of these queries in memory. And this makes it very complex and expensive. Now, what Hasura does is it joins all of these disparate data sources to create a single schema which you can then set up very declaratively with no additional code to be written. And you only need to specify, you know, which data source joins to what. And that's it. You can then query literally all of the information you need as if it were a, it were a single data source. And along with this, uh, you can also set up all of these capabilities like caching, monitoring, security features, like rate limiting, permissions. And you also get amazing performance and you can enable all of these, uh, you know, uh, additional capabilities on your top level API or your even individual upstream endpoints as well. So this gives you a lot of control in terms of architecting your API's uh, ground up. Now, the third focus point in our uh, federation story around change management is beautifully addressed by the Hasura schema registry. Uh, we'll go through more of, more of the details uh, in a bit, but uh, TLDR, the schema registry shows you all the changes in your GraphQL schema since the last iteration so that uh, you can quickly audit the changes, make sure that you're not breaking any of your applications before you push the updates to production. Now, this becomes an extremely powerful capability in the federated data world where all of your teams can work independently. And when you look at the unified API, you still have control over all the changes. Now, let us actually set up a federated data model and see how it all comes together. I'll use the same data model as the e-commerce example that we were talking about. I have the account table in a MySQL database, the order and order details tables in a Postgres database. The product details are exposed over an existing GraphQL API and the region where the order was placed, this is exposed over an existing REST API. We'll set this up and query some really nested data from different combinations of the data sources here. Now, before we get into that, a quick overview of uh, what all is possible with Hasura. Uh, Hasura allows joins across various kinds of data sources. So you can join uh, between two databases, a database and an existing GraphQL API to existing APIs. So all of the nine combinations in here are possible, and this can be done declaratively without the need to write, write any additional code. So this is all plug and play. And we'll take a couple of examples in today's demo. We'll do this step by step. I'm going to use Hasura Cloud for the demo. So in our uh, e-commerce example, we'll first connect the MySQL database to a Hasura instance. 
I have a Hasura instance here running. I'm going to go to the data tab and connect a MySQL database. I'll pick up the database URL. So now the database is connected. Uh, I'm going to use only the account table from the MySQL database and I'll track it. So this will add this to our GraphQL schema. We can quickly go ahead and check here in the API tab. Account is here. I'll be able to query the account ID and account name. And let's do this for like 10 records. So we are able to query the MySQL database. Now, what we'll do next is we'll go ahead and add the Postgres database, which has the order and order details tables. Again, I'll go back to data. Connect a database. I'll add a Postgres. I have an existing database. So I have both of these databases uh, running on RDS. So let's add the database URL and this is the order DB. So the second database, the Postgres database uh, with the orders is also connected. So we go to the public schema. I want to track only two tables, the order and the order detail tables, right? Now, when we go to the order table, uh, we have a couple of relationships here. So the order links to order detail by the order ID. So this is a suggested relationship. I'm going to track this and we go to order detail and there's a relationship back, which is also suggested. And I'm going to track that as well. Now let's go back and see if we are able to query the Postgres database. So Order is showing orders is showing up here. So the order table is here. The order details is also here. So both of them show up as types. And so I'm able to query this. And there is a foreign key relationship which also also shows up here, right? So I'll be able to query the number of units in the order details, the order ID here, and let's probably add a limit of three. There we go. So for this particular order ID, uh there are so many units of products being uh, ordered. So we also get the product ID. So we know which number of units for which product, right? Now, what we're going to do next is I want to join both the Postgres and the MySQL databases. And if you look at the data model, the account ID in the Postgres database is linked to the account, account ID in the order table of the MySQL database. Now, this was the internal relationship, and this is going to be a remote database join, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So I go to my data tab. I go to my account DB. And the account table, right? So I add a relationship to order and to the order table. So this is going to be an array relationship. So the account ID here maps to account ID in the order table. So let's create that relationship. Let's also add that relationship back. So in the order table, I add another relationship. So this is also a remote database relationship to account. There we go. So to account, so this will become an object relationship. So account ID here maps to account ID in the account table. Let's see what this means, right? So now we go back to our API Explorer tab. Uh, we take a look at account. So previously it was only account. Now if I see here, order is nested in the hierarchy under account. So if I look at the account ID and name and look at order, I'll be able to see the order ID and status. And if I just do a limit in here, let's just look at two of these. I'm able to run the query, right? So for this account ID and account name, I can see the order ID and the status as processing. And for the next account ID and account name, I again know the order ID and the status as processing. So what we've done here is an extremely powerful thing. So we have joined the MySQL and Postgres databases and queried the data together, right? And all of this happened instantly. I didn't write, didn't need to write uh, any other additional code to get this done.
Now, let's take this a step further. I'm going to join an existing GraphQL API to our GraphQL schema. So we can add an existing GraphQL API as a remote schema in here. So let's call the remote schema product. I'm getting the product information. So if you see here, I'm getting the product information from the existing GraphQL API. Let me pick up my GraphQL endpoint, add it in here, add an additional header, XHouser Adder and Secret, and we'll add the Adder and Secret in here. Let's add some namespaces here as well, and add the remote schema. Right. So if we go back to our API tab, there we go. So previously we had account and orders from the two different databases. Now we have product that has been uh, brought in from an existing GraphQL API. So I'm able to query the product ID and name and all of this. So let's quickly do that. I'm going to get two product IDs and the respective product name. So I'm able to do this, right? So what I'm going to do next is I want to join the existing GraphQL API to the joined data before. And if we take a look at the data model, so product ID of the graph from the GraphQL API links to product ID in the order detail table, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to my remote schema where I've added product. Let's go to relationships. I'm going to add a remote database relationship, right? And that goes to order detail. And this is an array relationship. I pick product. Let's pick the database. So it's in the orders DB, public schema, and order detail, right? Now, so product ID here maps to product ID here in the order detail table. And then we add the relationship. All right, perfect. And we can add the relationship backwards as well. So from product uh, order detail to product here. So we go to data, we go to order detail, Go to relationships and add another relationship. So I want to add this to product. And there we go. We can see the remote schema in here. We can see that where the ID is equal to the product ID from the order detail table. So I'm going to create this relationship. Let's go back to our API tab. Let's look at this magic that's happening here. So we go to product. And if we look at this here, we see that order detail is there in the hierarchy of product. So the existing GraphQL API and the uh, Postgres database where I have the order detail has been joined. And uh, uh, let's try something different right now, right? So I have a particular product ID, right? So I'm going to do where my product ID is equal to this particular ID number here. And I want to see an aggregate of how many orders have been placed under this product ID. All right, so let's run this query and see. There we go. So we see that 857 uh, orders have been placed for this product under different product IDs. So we can do a whole lot of things here. We can check what the order ID is. We can check what the product name is. And uh, so right now we have all these three joined together and we've seen uh, quite a nested query in here. So from product to order detail, we are counting the number of uh, orders placed here. All right. So now let's take this a step further. Now I have an existing REST API uh, get product, get region description that is exposing the uh, region value on an existing REST API. I want to uh, put this into my GraphQL scheme. So let's go ahead and do that. We can add existing REST APIs as actions to our Hasura instance. Uh, let's create an action. So I have a query parameter region value, which is a string and let's Define the action and declare the new types. There we go. And I need to get my REST endpoint. I'm going to share this uh, REST endpoint. You'll be able to query this uh, 
regularly also and we have now this is a get request all right and the region value Hello transform. Let's check. So the sample input is get region description with the region value. Right. And we take this, then we gotta change the response body. That's it. So let's create this action. Let's go ahead and check if we have the REST API exposed. There we go. So the get region description. Let's say my region value is south. I want to see the region description. Let's run this query. There we go. So the region description is Dixie. Let's now try to join this existing REST API to everything else. So we, were, we had already joined two databases and existing GraphQL API. I want to join the existing REST API to that as well. So I go back to actions, get region description. I want to add a relationship. And two. Okay, let's see the data model here, right? So the uh, region value in the existing REST API links to the order tables region, right? So this is an array relationship. I'm going to call this order because it's going back. So the orders DB, public schema, order table, let's pick the field. So the region maps to region here. All right, that is done. Let's go back and check if this has come up in our hierarchy. So get region description previously had only region uh, and the description, right? So now we also have order in the hierarchy. So if I want to do something like this, I want to know the description and the number of orders placed where the region value is south, right? So I want to do a count here. Let's run this query. There we go. So we have 296 orders that have been placed uh, in the region south. I can also uh, get the region description here, which is Tixie. So perfect. So we are able to query uh, from the existing REST API, which is joined to the rest of our data model. Right now, let's try something interesting. So now we have four different data sources. I want to be able to query something that is there across the four different data sources. Right. So let's start from here. Uh, so we do this. So in the region south, I want to see one order where the order ID I have the order ID. Let's pick up the order ID here. There we go. So I have the order ID and so I have uh, the account information coming in. I want to know the account ID and account name and I also have the order details, right? So the order details, I want to know what the product ID is from the order details table and now there's another step further and I want to know the product name. Look at this. So we start off with the REST API, then we go to one database, then we go to another database, and then we go to the GraphQL API. Let's run this query. So there we go. So we are able to get the information. So for this particular order ID, I have the account ID, the account name, the product ID, and what is the product name, right? So in this particular order, what all products have been there and what are their product IDs? Uh, so, so far we've seen that uh, we are able to join across multiple data sources and access all of the information in all of these data sources. I'm going to share the top level API so that you can also try all of these queries yourself. So what is the schema registry, right? The schema registry is a change log of your GraphQL schema. 
So every time you make changes to your underlying data model resulting in a change in the GraphQL schema, you'll be able to see these changes with respect to the last version of your schema. With this, you'll be able to easily audit changes from one version to the next and hence be able to confidently iterate. The schema registry gives you a history of each role-based schema as well. Now, let's take a look at this for our example that we've been talking so far. So let's go to the schema registry. It's there under settings and then schema registry. So this is how it shows up, right? So it shows you all of the breaking, dangerous and safe changes. So, so far we've been uh, adding a couple of tables, uh, adding a couple of uh, REST APIs and GraphQL APIs. So all of this shows up in your uh, GraphQL schema registry. Let's try and uh, do a couple of interesting things here. So I go to my orders uh, table and I want to track the region. Right. So as expected, this should show up in the schema registry. Now I want to do something destructive and I'm going to untrack this table. Now let's see how this reflects in our schema registry. Now, potentially if your uh, uh, client side uh, applications have been uh, querying your uh, region table in your orders DB, uh, if I have untracked that table and that is no longer accessible, that would have been disastrous, right? And as expected, this shows up as breaking changes in your schema registry. So the region table that was tracked under the orders DB. Uh, so all of this was removed from your GraphQL schema. And this is a breaking change. Right. And which was previously a safe change because I had added the region table. And then after that, I've removed the region table that showed up as a breaking change in your GraphQL schema. Now, uh, what the schema registry also does it is it shows you a role-based uh, schema as well. So let's go back to the data tab and let's go back to permissions. Say I'm going to create a new role here and without any checks, I want the user to be able to select all of these fields and I'll go ahead and change something else as well. Without any checks, I want the user to be able to insert into this right so now if i go back to my schema registry there we go so now we have a new entry here so the schema registry also shows you your role-based schema so the user role has been recently added and these are all the changes right so the user will be able to uh, insert and select all of the fields into the order table Right. So this is what uh, comes up in the schema registry. And so if you uh, have the schema registry on like a staging or pre prod kind of environment, you will be able to audit all of these changes. And if there are, uh, you know, breaking or dangerous changes flagged, you'll be able to fix it before pushing this to prod. Uh, this becomes an extremely powerful capability as if you're working with complex data models, like we've seen in this example, or with large number of teams, you still have the top level under control. And you can make sure that you're not breaking any consumers. Now you can also customize your email alerts for different kinds of changes. We also have some exciting items on the roadmap coming up, like, you know, Slack alerts, metadata mapping to your schema changes, which shows you what metadata change actually led to what schema change, operations coverage, and a lot more. So do go ahead and try out uh, the schema registry and uh, give us your feedback. Whereas in the DIY world, you would have needed to write everything right from GraphQL boilerplate code to make this happen. With Hasura, you get uh, extremely performant APIs with security, caching, and observability, all of this out of the box without writing any additional code. Now, this brings us to the end of our session today with some key takeaways. Uh, addressing all three aspects of the full life cycle of API development and federation Hasura gives you instant APIs over all of your data sources, and this significantly reduces uh, development time. And you can also easily federate across these multiple data sources as we've seen today, and build powerful data-driven apps or use this to drive business decisions. And finally, uh, iteration and collaboration over these complex federated models becomes a piece of cake with our federation and schema registry capabilities. With that, I'll wrap this session today. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, do try out Hasura's uh, federation and schema registry capabilities and do feel free to reach out to us with any questions or thoughts. Thank you.